Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop, which is, by the way, what he's doing right now, selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at WallStreetWindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. WallStreetWindow.com Hey you guys, welcome back to the show. As promised, one more guest, Sandy Tolan at uh, TomDispatch.com, the great Tom Englehart. And it'll be running, I'm looking at it right now, you guys will be able to see it uh, tomorrow at Antiwar.com as well. Uh, Sandy is a Tom Dispatch regular, he's the author of The Lemon Tree, An Arab, a Jew, and the Heart of the Middle East and the forthcoming Children of the Stone, about the building of a music school under occupation in the West Bank. Man, isn't that interesting? Hey, uh, welcome back to the show, Sandy. It's good to talk to you. And what a great article you've written here. It's called Going Wild in the Gaza War. Tom's got a great little introduction there, and then his uh, blown chances in Gaza, um, which is a very nice way of putting it here. But it's a very good history of, uh, more or less, since the democratic elections in Palestine in 2005 and the surprising victory of Hamas and the history of how we got to the current crisis since then and uh, I'm really uh, happy that you wrote this thing it's really good and I was hoping that you could really help fill us in on you know especially that early period there uh, the first couple of years because as I'm sure you're aware there's a very popular Israeli talking point which is that, well, we completely granted independence to Gaza back in 2005, and instead of making uh, paradise, they decided to uh, shoot their bottle rockets at us and force us to put them under siege. And, hey, maybe that's somewhat true. I don't know, but I sure would like to uh, really have some details about what really went down with the American and Israeli-engineered, in fact, election of 05, its results, and the aftermath. So please do tell, sir. Well, thanks. First of all, Scott, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's a it's a complicated history, as is so much in the Middle East. Um, I think it's uh, in this case. I mean, you can go back for years or even centuries, but or you know, even to the late nineteenth century, if you want to. But let's let's start in two thousand four and two thousand five, around the time that that Ariel Sharon two thousand five, when. Ariel Sharon had decided to so-called disengage from Gaza. 8,000 settlers were removed, the settlements were removed, and basically uh, the Israelis said, okay, now the Palestinians in Gaza, it's up to you to to make your paradise, as you said. I don't think they use those exact words, but you now have a free society. Well, in fact, the occupation never ended. Uh, Israel has always been in control. There's a brilliant book by a guy named A.L. Weitzman called The Hollow Land, uh, which is an architect's account of the architecture of the occupation, an Israeli architect uh, for that matter. And it's a very critical account. And in it, among other many things, uh, he explains, uh, as have others, that the occupation never really ended. It's controlled. Israel is controlling uh, the skies above Gaza, the seas around Gaza, um, and the and the ability to, for people and goods to remove or to to move in and out of Gaza, uh, it's no secret, and and there's good reason why Gazans uh, say that they're trapped in the largest um, open air prison in the world. So that's the context. Um, they never really were allowed to uh, for freedom. The 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 so called uh, corridor that was going to connect the West Bank and Gaza under the Oslo peace process never materialized, still hasn't to this day. And Gazans felt increasingly frustrated leading up to the 2006 election with the corruption of the very pro-Western Fatah organization. And Hamas was not elected because people wanted a terrorist movement in control. Uh, They were not elected because suddenly um, people didn't care about uh, having a just peace with freedom. They were elected because of the corruption of Hamas and the Hamas, I mean, it's corruption of Fatah rather, and Fatah's uh, inability to deliver any modicum of of freedom and 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 a just peace. So Hamas was elected. Now, uh, clearly, that Hamas was responsible for terrorist acts in the past, 
as were some Israeli organizations going back into the 1930s and 40s, whose leaders later became prime minister, uh, prime ministers of Israel. It's Yitzhak Shamir and, and uh, Shimon Peres. I mean, excuse me. It's Yitzhak Shamir uh, and Menachem Begin. Um, but what what is clear and not as well known is that Hamas, for years, and especially right after the 2006 election, was sending serious messages of reconciliation towards the Americans. In a letter written on handwritten and given to Jerome Siegel of the of the uh, Jewish Peace Lobby, um, and a professor based at the University of Maryland. Um, he basically, Ismail Haniya, the head of Hamas, uh, offered uh, to open a dialogue and pleaded almost to open a dialogue with the Bush administration. And in it, he said, we could understand, we, we are so worried about stability in this region that we would like to offer, uh, we are willing to accept um, uh, a, a state of Palestine on the 1967 borders and offer a truce for many years. Mm -hmm. This is basically de facto recognition of Israel and a, an agreement to, to cease hostilities, which was basically two of the big uh, things that the U.S., uh, the U.N., Europe, and Israel were requiring. Right. So there's a lot of background here that Hamas has reached out actually again and again, uh, and the answer uh, from Israel, supported by U.S. hardware and political backing, has been a war. All right. Well, thank you for being so polite. First of all, not correcting me when I said 05. It was January 06 when it, they had the election. Uh, uh, so that's an important point to mention there. And, and sorry for the error. Um, but then and, and the letter, you know, what? we may not even get back to it until after the break. But the letter and that entire theme is something that I want to go back to in just a minute. But I'd like to ask you a little more about the election itself, because I remember reading back then how they had this policy where, uh, you know, of course, Israel collects all the tax money and then they wouldn't give it to the Palestinian authorities. So they couldn't distribute it to pay all their employees and to pay off the people they needed to pay off in order to, frankly, buy their votes American style so they could win the election. And um, I read uh, Emily Hauser wrote a thing for the forward recently where she talked about it one effort or another. I forget that Condoleezza Rice had done to try to make it a little easier for Fatah to win the election and how the Israelis had stopped her. And uh, I just wondered whether you thought that maybe uh, the Israelis deliberately rigged the election of Hamas in 2006 uh, in order that they would have the excuse, divided and conquered, and these guys are terrorists, so we don't have to talk to them. The previous narrative had been, well, these guys aren't elected. Fatah, uh, you know, Arafat and his guys, they're not elected, so we don't have to talk to them. Then Hamas gets elected, and they go, well, they're terrorists, so we don't have to talk to them. And I just wonder if you thought that was on purpose or not. I rather doubt that Israel uh, was able to rig the elections. Um, uh, in It may have ultimately served their purposes. Uh, well, I didn't mean exactly like stuff and ballots, but they right. sort of I mean, you know, set it up that way, it seemed like, maybe. Elections were free and fair, and I think that the reason why Hamas was elected was, that, you know, as I said earlier, that, that they really wanted to, the, the people, not only of Gaza, but people in the West Bank were voting, too. They were tired of the corruption of Hamas. I mean, they didn't get a full 50% of the vote. Oh, the PLA, you meant. Of the of the of the of, of the Palestinian Authority is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, right, right, right. Of, of Fatah. Um, so so, what what happened was that the um, I, I mean I I think the idea that, that this plays into Israel's hand is is uh, that you're su that you're suggesting I think is a valid idea. But I think, um, you know. It was really a surprise election. I don't. I think yeah. everybody was stunned by the outcome. All right, and I'm sorry. You know what? I'm, we're out of time for this segment. Sandy, can you please hold on? We'll be right back, everybody. It's Sandy Tolan. This article's at TomDispatch.com. It'll be running tomorrow at AntiWar.com. We'll be right back in just a sec. Hey, Al Scott here. If you've got a band, a business, a cause, or campaign, and you need stickers to help promote, check out TheBumperSticker.com at TheBumperSticker.com. They digitally print with solvent ink. So you get the photo quality results of digital with the strength and durability of old style screen printing. I'm sure glad I sold the bumper sticker.com to Rick back when. He's made a hell of a great company out of it. And there are thousands of satisfied customers who agree with me too. Let the bumper sticker.com help you get the word out. That's the bumper sticker.com at the bumper sticker.com. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show. 
Uh, I'm Scott Horton. This is my show. Uh, the Scott Horton Show. I'm on the Liberty Radio Network. Uh, full archives, more than 3,000 of them now, going back to 2003 at scotthorton.org. And hey, this week is fundraising week. I'm trying not to beat you over the head about it too bad, but stop by scotthorton.org slash donate if you want. All right, we're talking with Sandy Tolan. He's written this great article for tomdispatch.com. It'll be running on antiwar.com tomorrow, Blown Chances in Gaza. And I'm sorry, I got us a little off track with what was going on with that election of 06 there. Um, uh, Sandy, you can finish up on that if you want. I think pretty much you'd made your point about it was it pretty much was a surprise. They didn't know what was going to happen. And then but uh, you do such a great job of in your article of talking about what came after that, uh, including, of course, as you mentioned, this letter from the leader of Hamas to George Bush saying basically like, hey, man, here's my handout. Let's talk. And then what happened? So uh, if you'd like to just go on with the story, you could uh, yeah. you can go back if you want to the, the election. Right. Well, so so what what was established in in in, 19, in 2006 during the Hamas election or after the Hamas election was that um, you know there there was a really an outreach at that point by Hamas for some sort of reconciliation with the United States and by implication with Israel because even though Hamas you know talks a hard line. Um, and saying that they want to basically eliminate Israel, and, and if you look at the Hamas Charter, it's it's disgusting. Nevertheless, you know, as I said before, there are other organizations that have been considered terrorist organizations who said they would never compromise, and then in the back channels there are other signals. This was a back channel offer uh, for a serious discussion and um, and a willingness to go uh, much further than Hamas had ever publicly said. Uh, to create essentially what was the U.S. policy, which is the two-state solution, and to uh, offer a, a truce from these were the conditions, uh, two of the large conditions that the U.S. and Israel uh, had held over Hamas. The fact that George Bush and the Bush administration um, did not even reply to that letter is not really surprising, but then that, nevertheless it's striking and a striking piece of evidence that the U.S. and Israel were much more interested in smashing Hamas at the great human cost for the people of Gaza, as they have been um, really several times in these wars over the last eight years. And even at the time, John McCain said, well, yeah, of course you have to talk to Hamas. So that just goes to show that it wasn't, you know, he wasn't saying, of course you have to talk to Osama bin Laden. He was saying you have to talk to Hamas, and that was reasonable. Right, and you have, Scott, a number of people in the Israeli security establishment over the years who have said much the same thing. I mean, including um, a brigadier general who is the, uh, the head of the Gaza division for the Israeli uh, army, uh, for the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, and the former chief of the Mossad, which is Israel's CIA. They were both saying, look, you, you know, one of them said, um, you know, the devils of, of t today could be people we could deal with tomorrow, the devils of yesterday, could be people we could deal with today. They didn't listen to him, and then more recently, uh, uh, Shmuel, Shmuel Zakai, uh, uh, former Brigadier General, said, look, you can't just pound the people of Gaza and Hamas and, and expect them to not respond at all. We need to engage them. This kind of advice has been ignored, and it was again uh, in 2014, and this latest war was really as unnecessary or maybe even more so uh, than all the others. Well, now, can you take us a little bit through the cause and effect, maybe with an eye toward the debunking of this talking point, if you think it deserves debunking, about, you know, what exactly took place? Of course, there's the Gaza bombshell, the coup, and, and, and Hamas ended up taking control of the whole strip, I guess, in 2007. But, um, you know, if you could tell that story as fast as you can about how we got from the election of Hamas to the outright siege, because the Israeli story is they just kept shooting rockets at us, and so that's all you need to know. Well, I mean, Israel has had Gaza in a blockade for many years. I mean, the sanctions were imposed immediately after the election uh, in 2006 because even though it was a free and fair election, uh, Israel and the West decided it would not uh, contend with a terrorist organization. and and. You know, as, as I've, Avi Schleim, uh, who's a, a former 
a member of the Israeli army um, and, a, and a historian at, at the University of uh, at Oxford College in the UK said, you know, here you have uh, the basically the oppressed who are getting sanctions put on them and the oppressors are the ones who are imposing the sanctions with support of the international community. Um, Israel has put a siege on, on Gaza for many years. Um, the, the, the rockets are not justified in my view, but they're in, in many ways a response to, these, to this intolerable situation uh, and the human condition in Gaza with increasing malnutrition, hunger, and then the bombings take out not only uh, targets, military targets, they're taking out schools, they're taking out refugee shelters, they're taking out um, uh, power plants, um, and many more civilians have died than um, alleged combatants or combatants themselves. So this situation continued all the way through up until 2014. Um, and in 2014, Hamas was no longer in control of its destiny to the extent it had been a little bit earlier because Iran, Egypt, and Syria, for all different political and military reasons, had essentially withdrawn or sharply reduced their support to Hamas. And Hamas was desperate. And they came to Fatah again for a reconciliation agreement. And they agreed to conditions they never would have agreed to before because of the reality, the political, geopolitical reality. And they basically were not quite on their knees, but basically saying, you know, we will give over all this power to Fatah, which will essentially run this coalition government. It was an amazing opportunity for Israel and the U.S. And the answer again, this time for the, from the Obama administration and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, was war. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is just so incredible and important to emphasize here, I think, that, you know, what it means that Hamas was willing to sign on from Fatah. If you watch CNN, they'll go, oh, my God, Fatah is getting in bed with Hamas, the terrorists. But what was really going on, as you're saying, is Hamas is saying, OK, you guys take the lead and and decide what we're going to do with the U.N., decide what we're going to do as far as talking with the Israelis so we can go ahead and get a move on here with you know, at least preserving the status quo instead of sitting back and watching it just get worse and worse and worse forever. Yeah, I mean, you, there's a good piece by the by Nathan Thrall, who's an analyst with the International Crisis Group and based in Jerusalem, uh, in the New York Times on July 17th, and he says the government could have served Israel's interest. It offered Hamas's political adversaries a foothold in Gaza. It was formed without a single Hamas member. It retained the same Ramallah-based prime minister, deputy prime ministers, finance minister, and foreign minister. And most important, it pledged to comply with the three conditions for Western aid long demanded by America and Europe, nonviolence, adherence to past agreements, and recognition of Israel. And this is an incredible opportunity that was blown, another blown chance to avoid war in Gaza. And as, and as a result, instead, we have 1,900 <coughs> Gazans dead by U.N. estimates, nearly three-quarters of those civilians. Yeah, this is that a blown implies you know, an accident. But as you talk about in here, Netanyahu deliberately lied the Israelis into this so-called war. Yeah, I mean, the, the war is very popular in Israel, and, I, and, and there are complicated reasons for that. I think a lot of it goes back to how deeply traumatized Israeli society is uh, from the legacy of the Holocaust, that, that uh, political leaders over the years, including Netanyahu himself, have not been shy to exploit. And that's happened, in my view, in this uh, terrible tragedy as well. Yeah, but I mean, when you talk about the kidnapping of the boys and the Israeli police and intelligence services, knowing good and well they were already dead, but pretending for three weeks or two and a half weeks or so that, oh, yeah, we're going to negotiate with Hamas and, and, oh, we know it was Hamas and all of this stuff in order to beat the drums and then even strikes on the 6th before the rocket attacks of the 7th in yeah. Gaza. It, I mean, there are strong indications, as you say, that, that they knew well in advance that these, these teenagers tragically had already been murdered. But that what's, what that indicates is what they were really wanting and looking for was a pretext to crush Hamas. Uh, by some reports, only 10% of those interrogated, the 400-some people who were interrogated, and many of them later put into uh, Israeli jails without charge or due process, um, many, only 10% of them were actually questioned about, uh, about the abductions of the teenagers. What this, what this indicates 
is that they were out to crush Hamas and crush the unity agreement. And the irony is the unity agreement ain't dead. Right. Yeah. All of it, basically. And they didn't really accomplish their goals. They didn't want to overthrow Hamas. And they didn't. Yeah. And Hamas, you know, just like Hezbollah in 2006, when Israel pledged to crush it, you know, they may emerge stronger right. than before. Which, in a twisted way, would also serve the Israelis' purpose that they can keep playing the how can we deal with people like this? There's no one to talk to, at, you know, ad infinitum. Yeah. Well, you know, what, what my hope is that is that eventually the U.S. will come to understand that this kind of absolute unquestionable, unquestioning backing of a, a, a military alliance with Israel is not in the United States people's interests. And we need to question this sort of absolute uh, refusal to recognize that, that the rights of people to, to live and to live in freedom um, should not be trumped by domestic polit political considerations that don't even take into account the U.S.'s own true interests. Right. All right, well, we're already over time, but thank you so much for your time, Sandy. I sure appreciate it. It was really good talking to you, Scott. Good Thanks. interview. Great article, too. And uh, we'll be, uh, again, posting it tomorrow, everybody, on antiwar.com. Thanks again. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Hey, you own a business? Maybe we should consider advertising on the show. See if we can make a little bit of money. My email address is scott at scotthorton.org. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. If this nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone, we are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com. You hate government? One of them libertarian types? Or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers? Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still. If you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, all Scott here. If you're like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it taste good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at darrenscoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world. All specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. Darren's Coffee. Order now at darrenscoffee.com. Use promo code SCOTT and save $2. darrenscoffee.com.